Right, I'll just get started. Um, so, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. Today, we have Bjorn Lutkens, who is a postdoc at MIT, who works at the intersection of climate modeling and um, machine learning. And I think there's a lot of um, sim like common threads between the kind of deep learning emulation stuff we do in astrophysics or don't do and um, the kinds of problems they encounter with climate. So I think it's going to be an exciting talk. Thank you for the introduction. And hello, everybody. Um, so today I'll be sharing with you a cautionary tale about deep learning based climate emulators. When I say climate emulators, I mean broadly that we have like a very computationally expensive climate model that has already been used to generate a large data set, which is called CMET. And then we want to find past approximations to this data set to sort of fluently interpolate in between the parameter sets that we didn't get to explore. And I think that broad setup, you know, while, while I'm not in astrophysics, I think maybe that broad setup will help us uh, find some similarities in between our, our research. And um, at MIT, I'm part of the MIT Climate Grant Challenges, um, which sort of set out to use uh, machine learning for climate more broadly. Okay, so why are we doing this? Climate models are computationally very expensive for exploring policy emission scenarios. So what you can see here on the left is sort of what's, what's guiding global international policy making and climate policy making is where you have emission scenarios um, that until 2020 are in the past, but then they branch off into multiple pathways that assume maybe we do business as usual, or maybe we have some form of negative carbon emission technology. So these climate scenarios have been cooked up by some uh, climate scientists, but we only decided that we have four scenarios that are the most relevant, but one can imagine all the scenarios that are possible in between those. Now, for those four scenarios that we internationally agreed upon, climate models were wrong. Um, in this case, um, sort of each center, each climate science center in the world um, developed a climate model and then ran their climate model for these scenarios. And now that gives us sort of a very large data set um, that contains about 20 petabytes of data of uh, expected climate impacts given these scenarios. The issue with that is each climate model, um, if run on one scenario, takes about two weeks on a 20,000 CPU core supercomputer um, at moderate resolutions. So if you were to do that on AWS, it would cost you $300,000 per scenario that you want to simulate. So clearly that's too infeasible to interpolate in between all these scenarios. And we're thinking about how can we find an approximation to this climate model to interpret it. So this idea of climate approximations or climate emulation is not novel. People have been doing this for a while. So what you can hear, for example, is um, a tool that's being used actively by policymakers. Um, it's called OnRoads. It also came out of MIT. And what it allows you now is to take climate policies, slide them in real time. Uh, those feed into an energy policy model uh, that then spits out a new scenario that then goes into a into a globally averaged model, and it tells you this expected um, emissions and temperature increase by 2100. This model is very successful. It's been used by 200,000 people all over the world. The numbers are growing, and primarily because it's so fast to compute, it runs in the fractions of a second. But we can only see the global temperature increase. So it cannot be used to explore local impacts and it can hardly be used to talk about, um, you know, should the, what happens if, the, if, if only the US reduces the emissions uh, or only India or only China reduce their emissions, um, it can, can be used to explore that. So how do we emulate the effect of climate policies onto local climate impacts? And um, that I've been doing uh, throughout my PhD and also throughout this um, bringing climate through this MIT climate grant challenge where the idea is we can go sort of from these climate policy sliders to the very, very localized impacts. What you can see here is a, a satellite visualization that we worked on that sort of has the impact at 50 centimeter resolution of um, uh, no flood versus this is a flood models prediction that's been casted into a visualization. Okay, so, but, 
we've, we've been talking about this mapping from climate policies to like 50 centimeter resolution visualizations. So to disentangle this a bit, I'm going to go through the systems architecture of what such an emulator would look like. So in the climate model, we have um, a very low resolution climate state that is used as initial conditions. And then we have a lot of differential equations, such as, for example, Navier Stokes, or some radiative equations that, that are baked into the climate model, which is then uh, explicitly run forward into the future. During that, we use as forcings um, these CO2 emission scenarios, or CO2, and then also aerosols, such as black carbon, uh, sulfur dioxide, or methane. Once we have this very low resolution state, um, because this we only can do at 100 kilometer resolution feasibly, we can downscale it uh, onto, let's say, 100 kilometer resolution. Then still looking at the state variables such as uh, temperature, um, pressures, humidity, those are the variables that are being simulated. And then once we have this high resolution field, we can feed it into a chain of impact models. For example, in this case, a hurricane track model that fed into a storm surge then fed into a flood model, that then fed into a storm surge model to give us uh, the expected storm surge uh, here in Houston around the river in red. And that finally, we can feed it to some form of visualization engine to, communi to, 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 to communicate it to the public. One of the issues with this approach is that right now, uh, each of these steps are based on uh, differential equation solvers, which can become very computationally expensive at high resolutions. So we cannot run them in real time and we can only run them for select scenarios. So what I've been working on throughout my PhD is to sort of to tackle that computationally expensive the various works. And today I want to talk in particular about what if we skip this dynamical core and emulate to go directly from emissions to low resolution climate impacts, uh, sorry, climate state variables. So this is an applied AI project, and I think the first step in an applied AI project is often to come up with a benchmark that everybody agrees on, because once we have a benchmark, there will become there, there will be better machine learning models that sort of improve on this benchmark that domain scientists, um, where the domain scientists have agreed on the evaluation metrics. So again, in this benchmark, this is the most commonly benchmarked, the most commonly used benchmark in this field of climate emulation. Um, and then set up the problem as follows, where again, you have these emission scenarios. And then in this case, there was one model, the Norris M model from, from Scandinavia that was run three times per scenario. We run the model multiple times per scenario um, to, to simulate the internal variability, sort of El Nino and La Nina, things that are unpredictable. And we run this model three times per scenario. And then we get here, for example, the mean of those three realizations, uh, the global temperature anomalies over time. You can see they're increasing with CO2. And then the machine learning model has available as inputs uh, maps of black carbon and sulfur dioxide for each year, and also the globally average cumulative CO2 emissions and methane emissions. Uh, I'm sorry if you might not be able to see all the way to the bottom. So the machine learner can has now these um, annually average fields and it can use as many uh, years in the input as the machine learner finds reasonable. And then the target for that is a map. So that's an image in this case of surface temperature, but we also have in the data set there temperature range, precipitation, extreme precipitation. We train on four scenarios and we hold the fifth one out, which is saying that um, if we can interpolate for a new scenario, uh, that would mean that theoretically we could interpolate for the other scenarios in between as well. So on this benchmark, um, uh, right now people are citing deep learning models to be the best models possible. So we have the CNN LSTM, which is a standard architecture from uh, for spatial temporal dynamics. And we can see here that if this was the target of the surface temperature map, um, we can see this climate pattern such as a stronger warming in the Arctic than in the average. We have stronger warming over land than over sea. We have an um, Arctic warm uh, at North Atlantic cold blob. And the predicted model is very similar to that. And we can then measure that with the normalized mean squared error in between these two fields as prescribed by climate bench. 
Okay, so when I said, you know, once there's a benchmark, the community will pick it up. So the machine learning community picked this up and then they developed um, a transformer based model transformers that came out of this paper. Attention is all you need. I think maybe five years ago, by now it has 10,000 citations. It's going through the roof. Um, but notably now, when one uses these transformers, the benchmark results are state of the art on the climate bench, even when the model was trained using only 80 NVIDIA V100 GPUs. So one NVIDIA, that, that's approximately 360 desktop GPUs that went into this model and it has 100 million, 100 million parameters, but at least it was worth it. We have a little bit lower normalized mm -hmm. square error. Okay, so this is um, before I started working on this and now um, this is my work where we thought about, okay, what if we take a little bit of a step back and um, we just take global cumulative CO2 emissions, we ignore all the aerosols and the methane, we map that onto global temperature by just one linear regression model that has two parameters, and then we fit one linear regression model per grid cell um, to map global onto local parameters. That gives us a 30,000 parameter model approximately. And again, we use exactly the same data set and a fair comparison, and we can see if this is the target then now this is the prediction that the linear regression model um, does. And indeed, if we compute the normalized mean squared error, it's even lower than the current benchmarks incumbent. And this is actually not only surface air temperature, but if we re repeat this study on the diurnal temperature range, precipitation, and the extreme precipitation, then we can see that the linear kind of scaling is the best model, better than the climate X, the vision transformer, random forest, the CNN LSTM, and the Gaussian process on the spatial error of um, surface air temperature precipitation and extreme precipitation. Only for uh, diurnal temperature, only for the spatial diurnal temperature value, um, the climate X model was a little bit better. And for global precipitation, um, and uh, sorry, gen generally the, the global variables. So I think this is <clears throat> such an important message because with machine learning being all over the media, we, we sort of expect that the deeper learn of, that deep learning models will be very good, um, sort of better than, than the simple machine learning models, but indeed a simple domain informed baseline can be very good and should always be implemented first on a benchmark data set. But uh, from the domain sciences, does that actually mean now that the linear planet scaling model, this, uh, that's how this model was called, is the most accurate climate emulator out there. And I think uh, actually not yet, because we talked earlier about the realizations, and we can see here in this, in this global temperature um, uh, plot that there is all these wiggles that are still left in the climate bench data set. So these wiggles, they, they, they are, they're known not to be a forced signal. They're known not to um, be uh, predictable from CO2, methane, like carbon and sulfur dioxide. So we want to average them out in our data set. So that's what, and, 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 these, and these wiggles, they're even stronger than at the local scale. For example, if we plot um, the temperature in Greenland over time, then in red, you can see that the variations from year to year are on the scale of, uh, of, of two degrees almost, which is almost the same as the forced signal in the first place. When I say forced signal, I mean that uh, sort of in 2000, we can see the CO2 increasing and then that uh, the, the temperature increasing. And that forced signal is what we want to uh, predict with our emulator. Okay, so three realizations are insufficient to average out the internal variability, which is why we compiled a new data set that has 50 instead of three realizations using the Max Planck model from Germany. And now we can see the same plot again, where you can see in red the line and in blue the global, the global mean, which, is, um, which has significantly less fluctuation, significantly less internal variability. So we reduce the amount of internal variability, but it doesn't actually matter for the purpose of having a benchmark. For that, we came up with an experiment where we said we trained two models. We trained the pattern scaling and the CNN LSTM on a random subset of n realizations um, and evaluated on the mean of the 50. So we, we now have 50 realizations. We take three realizations, we calculate the mean, and we train the models on that, and we evaluate on the mean of 50. 
for example, assuming that the mean of 50 is the ground truth uh, climate mean. And that is a very reasonable assumption that um, people say is generally true. Okay, at lower means better now, and we can see what this results. So, so this is the root mean squared error over the number of realizations that we have in the train set. Lower means better, and we can see in blue that for the low number of realizations, uh, for in this case precipitation, indeed the CNN LSTM was better than the linear pattern scaling, but as we increase the number of realizations in our training data set, actually the signs flip, and then CNN LSTM is able to outperform the linear pattern scaling model again. So um, here, this we had the result for the climate bench, sort of, and then and then on n on fifty, on n fifty, we can see that the signs flip. So the so so we wonder why. Um, definitely, this internal variability needed to be explicitly addressed in climate emulation because the the the. The reason is that the CNN LSTM has so many parameters that it saw these fluctuations in the training set, it would overfit on the fluctuations in the training set, then continue to predict fluctuations in the validation, um, which were not which, which 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 were further off than a linear pattern scaling model that was naturally regularized to just fit in between um, that variability. Uh, now on on this one, I'm not saying that this that this slide the decrease in root mean squared error actually matters from the domain sciences. But what I am saying now is that we have a much more robust way to assess now which model is the better model, and that in the first place was the purpose of a benchmark data set. So we can um, repeat this analysis now for um, surface temperature, and for surface temperature, we can see that linear regression indeed was maybe all you need, uh, it was continuously better than the CNN LSTM. And in global precipitation, now we're quite certain that the linear pattern scaling uh, does not do very well in comparison to a more computationally expensive model. And we're thinking about now, why is that the case from the domain sciences? Okay, so the key takeaways, the linear emulator um, could outperform all deep learning models on this existing benchmark data set, but the result was rather due to the noise, the internal variability, than the signal that we wanted to predict. And addressing this noise in, in, in the benchmark was necessary to declare which model actually is better. Um, thank you very much. I'm sending a preprint out soon. But in the meantime, uh, you can follow this QR code if you want, which, which guides to a um, tutorial that writes up the linear analysis of this in an interactive Jupyter notebook. And thanks again to all the co-authors that helped with this and Schmidt Sciences who funded this. Okay, thank you. So how do you thought about, it? I mean, if you don't actually, if you just care about the variance, right, the noise, you know, and that's influencing your, your, your linear regression. Um, if you don't care about the actual fluctuations, just that, that there is variance and that, that, that you, you can approximate that variance. Have you tried to train a model just on the variance in addition to the mean? Uh, so then like maybe a linear pattern scaling that forecasts the like, like just like you don't know the exact fluctuations, but you know there's some variance in your mean, mm -hmm. right? And that variance can be predicted. Yes. Yeah. I think, it, uh, yes, in parallel, we have another student, um, Andre Zolder, who's working on using diffusion models to predict the full distribution of the of the climate signal in the future, um, but then there as well, there's sort of the question that a Gaussian model actually is very good um, because a mean and the standard deviation already captures most of the signal, yeah. and then it does feed further into question: okay, which which application actually requires such a precise knowledge of the of the probability distribution? Mm -hmm. But yeah, good point. I was wondering the climax model. So I remember they kind of marketed it as like a foundation model of course. So were they training on a lot of heterogeneous data sets or were they also training on exactly what the other baselines trained on? Uh, yes, yeah, you're right. The climax model, it was also, it had, um, it was sort of, it is sort of marketed as a foundation model and then foundation model meaning that, um, 
it builds a foundation for like it has a very, very large data set available so that we can then use that model to fine tune on other data sets. So in this case, the very large data set they had was uh, the CMIP data set, um, more of the CMIP data set than Climate Bench had available, and also era five data set, which is um, like a like a reanalysis of historical weather patterns. So they had much more data available. Uh, and then they fine tuned it on climate bench. I think I'm just trying to unravel whether the reason they might have done badly is just because you don't need that kind of architecture for the problem, or whether they just had like, too many data sets mixed. But I don't mm. really hear the fact that they fine tuned in such a case. Yeah, I guess yeah, the whole is yeah. right. I think the reason is probably both that one, the architecture was a bit of an overkill, and two, then. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we are trying to find to fit a linear model and then we pre-train on on the whole corpus of climate weather data, then maybe that's not very helpful. Yeah. So is there any are, are you going to take a, a, a larger train set? Are you going to build a larger train set? Is there any plans to like you know, the Max Planck data set seemed very large, but it's only 50 models. There are 50 realizations, right? Mm. Is there, are there talks about building even a larger training set? Mm. Yeah. Um, I think what's really interested is, interesting is we see now in like nature and science, there were uh, recently ultra aggressive machine learning models published um, that are, that outperformed weather models that we're using right now. So right now with the, ECMWF, for example, is the European weather model. It forecasts the weather for 15 days. And now there's a new paper called GraphCast by Google, which is doing the same weather work forecast a little bit more accurate than ECMWF in, a, in, in, in minutes instead of hours. So I think that is sort of like, kind of like a revolutionary uh, idea for many of the weather people and for the climate scientists. And now people are also thinking about how to do that for climate emulation. So in that case, we would have 50 realizations and then they build us the data set where then we have a data point every six hours and then we train a machine learning model to predict the next six hours based on the previous two snapshots. So some people are working on that. In the end, I'm assuming that, uh, you know, I'm also thinking about working on that, but in the end, I'm assuming that that will give us a climate emulator that is sort of on the scale of, that runs on the scale of minutes to hours, because we still have to integrate it for um, until 2100. Whereas here, I was presenting emulators that run on the scale of fractions of a second, with the purpose of integrating them into a web page. So in the end, it becomes two different sort of modeling paradigms. Yeah. Yeah. I have another question, but other people have questions. Um, okay, so I guess it's one. Oh, there, there was one question okay. behind you. Yeah, please go ahead. Um, I think that um, it's really interesting to see the taking the whole atmospheric dynamics out of the equation and like skipping all of our differential gradients, et cetera. And mm -hmm. so you show these very specific sort of improvements on like precipitation that's really interesting to see if it's changing the equation. Can you comment a little bit further on like additional? Um, additional markers like where it's doing well and not doing well. Um, so yeah, like in addition to just like temperature and like the but there are some other um, categories that are are both doing well and not doing. Well. Mm, yes, yes. So I guess the question is sort of what are the other um situations in which linear patterns getting breaks out? Yeah. Yes. Um. So yes, a global precipitation breaks down. We are not entirely sure why, but what's also I, I don't I have a, I have a plot exactly on this. Let me just check if it's in the back if it's if it's in the backup. Uh, it's not. So then I'll just talk about it. But um, one thing is. Um, irreversible events. So the linear assumption is assuming that once we have negative emission technologies uh, that take CO2 out of the atmosphere again, 
then the temperature will also drop to the same to the same rate. Well, that might hold for temperature approximately, but it definitely doesn't hold for things like sea level rise um, because those uh, sort of operate on a much more negative time scale. And it also doesn't hold for temperature in all locations. So that's definitely one place where linear pattern scaling does break down. Um, the other places are with aerosols. Um, aerosols have um, uh, influenced the precipitation in a quite nonlinear way, and that's not uh, well captured in the pattern scale. Yeah. So, a little bit related to Kirsten's question. Uh, did I understand correctly that the 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 quantities on which you your uh, linear pattern behaves better than than the CNN LSTM mm -hmm. uh, CNN LSTM are uh, cases in which you might be dominated by the variability of or the noise in the signal. Is that is that the case? I, I didn't quite follow. Um, under which conditions your linear pattern model is actually better, mm -hmm. even when you consider the variability of noise in, in the patterns. You mentioned mm -hmm. something that I thought was very valuable, and you said sometimes a very simple model with some uh, domain information is uh, is better than this complicated... Uh, well, I, I don't know if people agree these days that a CNN is very complicated anymore because we're getting more. <laughs> but in any case, uh, so I, I tried to figure out what sort of domain information is it that you can give, uh, you know, your particular type of models so that your relatively simple linear pattern model works better than a CNN. And I'm, and I'm asking this because I'm trying to make a connection with what we do in astrophysics, where we can also try to predict some quantities and cosmology or something. And uh -huh. what is the sort of domain knowledge that you are? imprinting to your analysis to make it better. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good question. So what is the amount, what is the domain knowledge that influenced um, linear pattern scaling being so good? So before this, there was already quite a lot of works that have shown that um, uh, cumulative CO2 emissions is predominantly linear with respect to temperature. So I think that was one, one, one very good domain knowledge that was already in the field. Um, and I think that 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 domain knowledge didn't exist for precipitation though. Like for precipitation, people would say that nonlinear models actually are better. And that led us to investigate further why the linear model would now all of a sudden outperform the more nonlinear models. Um, and then I guess the other part of the domain knowledge was that uh, that we know that some part of the noise does not relate to the inputs that we have available. So we want to average out the noise that we cannot forecast with the given inputs in the data set already, rather than having the model average those out. Yeah. Thanks. That's great. So there are a lot of potential models between linear and neural net. <laughs> right. Considered something um, just slightly more free than lin a linear model, but not a neural net. Uh, yeah, I, I did it. Uh, polynomial regression um, on these on these variables and it was a little bit better for I think temperature than even better than the no for for, for, for one of the variables. I'm not entirely sure right now so I don't want to overstate but one one idea that um, I'm wondering about is the the a fully connected neural net um, breaks down to be a linear model if it only has one layer and no activations. Right. So what I'm wondering is if we could take this fully connected neural net and then do a whole sweep over the number of layers or the number of units, sort of saying, um, as we and 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 and, and then plot uh, the the error over the number of parameters, and then hopefully have a curve that kind of goes like this that tells us the optimal regime of how many parameters are needed. For each model that could then tell us something like the data complexity per per variable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can also, I guess, do something where you have these, you know, CNN where you could do a parameter sensitivity analysis using like Kramerow or something like that, where you go through the various free parameters and see how many you do you actually need on one of these trained networks that are already trained. Right? Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I haven't thought about that yet. Yeah. That's cool. Um, okay, should we um, 
call it a day and go to the pool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>